Greetings. My name is Brian Johnson. Welcome to the Blue Belt Podcast. I am here to introduce you to the world of Norwegian folklore, the world of Peter Asbjornsen and his colleague Jorgen Mo. Many scholars, authors, educators, and casual readers know the tales recorded by the Brothers Grimm, Hans Christian Andersen, the Arabian Nights Entertainment Volumes, and Joseph Jacobs. I am here to introduce you to a corner of folklore that is lesser known and not explored or adapted by the media as often as other bodies of folklore. Now sit back, relax, and listen to the anecdotes of Peter S. Bjornsson and Jorgen Moe. Welcome back to the Blue Belt Folktale Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the reading and to the preservation of Norwegian folklore. My name is Brian Johnson, and I will be narrating these stories, as well as hosting the discussion that follows. We are now at episode 9, which is the last episode of this season. I'm going to take a two-week break and then return with a biographical episode on Abjornsen and Mo, Peter Christian Abjornsen and Jorgen Mo. But for now, I'm going to read one more story, another shorter story called everyone thinks their own children are best now i've been comparing the two shorter stories i've told before to aesop's fables this might be the best example it's maybe one fifth of a page long and although it's short it has a lot to unpack like beauty is in the eye of the beholder as well as the simple but powerful lesson of the idea that if you're not specific, if you don't give people specific directions, then you have a very slim chance of getting what you want. And this is also a very good folktale that exhibits the fact that people aren't always going to agree with you over standards of what's good or bad. But anyway, I digress. This is Everyone Thinks Their Own Children Are Best. A hunter was once walking through the forest when he came upon a woodcock. My dear friend, don't shoot my children, said the woodcock. Which birds are your children? asked the hunter. The loveliest ones in the forest are mine, replied the woodcock. All right, those are the ones I won't shoot, said the hunter. But when he came back, he was carrying a whole clutch of woodcock fledglings he'd shot. Oh no, why did you shoot my children after all, said the woodcock. Are these yours? asked the hunter. I shot the ugliest birds I could find. Alas, replied the woodcock, don't you know that everyone thinks their own children are best? So that was Everyone Thinks Their Own Children Are Best, a very short story but a story packed full of humor and a ton of insight. As a child, I always liked finding the shortest stories, the shortest stories in these books full of folklore. And often they'd be very funny, I would find. And now that I'm older, it's refreshing to find one of these again, even though this is a story that I've read in the past. Now, if you've noticed, Every third story or so has been extremely short. This one being the shortest at around, what, 40 seconds? And every time I've kind of said that these remind me of an Aesop fable, something you would find in one of his volumes. If you replaced the Christian and Catholic figures of St. Peter and the Lord Jesus with... Zeus or Jupiter and another deity, maybe Hermes, I'm not sure what his Roman name is, but just another god, I think that you could easily sneak that fable into an Aesop collection with no one noticing. The fox as shepherd might work even better if you just remove maybe some of the singing and the rhyming and simplify it a bit 
it works the same way. But this story, considering its length, as, as well as some of the dialogue, I would say that this story, everyone thinks their own children are best, could easily be slapped into a book of Aesop's Fables by changing nothing. The only thing that you would change is the term woodcock or snipe, because that term, even though it's a generalization for seven or eight types of birds, it wasn't invented until, or I shouldn't say invented, it wasn't in print until about a thousand years ago. All right, so now that I've gone over my basic opinion and what I know about the story, let's talk about possible morals and possible lessons it has for children and adults as a fable. Now, one idea I had for this podcast, or not idea, one objective, is to kind of analyze these old tales and see if they still have some inherent value if the lessons are still appropriate. Often as we grow older, both as as humans and as a society, we find that not all advice is timeless. And it's wise now and then to visit the past and see if their teachings are still of some value, are still of some good value see if these stories and teachings help us progress. So anyway, with that in mind, here is some possible morals I came up with. Usually for me, I think any story, even if the protagonist isn't a hero per se, can have one good moral, at least one. If it has multiple, even better. This story is very short, but it has three or four valuable lessons that will really be important in the long run. The most obvious one is that family members will often think of you more highly than other people in society, which isn't always true, but most likely it will. So, A good lesson is don't expect to be treated equally by everyone, even though that's been a goal amongst humans for since the beginning of time. Another lesson is that there is no set beauty standard, or there is, but there isn't one absolute object or person that everyone will find irresistible. Now, the other moral I came up with which I think is the most powerful, but also the most simple at the same time, is the idea that the more specific that you are, the more direct you are with your speech, the more successful you will be. Obviously in this story, not being direct is what cost the woodcock their children. If you aren't clear about what you want, then there's almost a 50-50 chance that you will end up with some sort of disappointment. And that disappointment is entirely your fault. Now, if I asked a random friend for whatever reason to bring me back, to bring to my house a box of chocolate, and I didn't specify that I'm allergic to nuts, then I could very well be in the hospital that night. So we have this idea that being vague is such an easy and simple thing to do, but there's often a 50% chance that when we are vague, when we don't give specific details, we almost always risk our happiness. Another possible lesson is just the simple idea of being wary of strangers, but that won't really be repeated too much on my discussion in this episode. 
So now that I've kind of separated these three, four different morals, I'm going to apply them to our characters in the story. Let's start first with the woodcock. Now, when I was doing my research and pre-reading the story, I was not sure what a woodcock was. Considering the age of these stories and the term, I just considered that, I thought that a, a woodcock would be like a wild rooster, a, a wild chicken. But I wanted to be sure, so I looked it up. And I found that a woodcock is a general term for about 40, not 40, eight, seven or eight different types of birds that look similar. And another thing I found about the woodcock is that it is a very strange looking bird. Now, words like ugly, repulsive, hideous, homely, those are, are words I like to use very sparingly. I can probably count on one hand the amount of times that I've openly called someone unattractive. But a woodcock is extremely strange looking. Anyone w would be justified in calling the woodcock an ugly bird. They have a very, a very short body, tiny legs, very small heads that are drastically smaller than their body, and a beak or a bill that appears to be much longer than their body. It's almost too big. It's almost like their body is too big for their head. And their beak is too big for their body. And they also don't have an especially attractive color. They're this shade, they're these shades of gray, brown, and with, with an occasional speck of black. So whoever wrote this down the story first, or rather, whenever the story was, for, was first told, they made a wise de decision by selecting a woodcock as the protagonist. It also works because a woodcock is a generalization. A woodcock is not one exact bird. It's many. And I thought that was a nice uh, cryptic symbolism. And now let's look at the hunter. A huntsman or a hunter usually, if they're not a game hunter, is a kind of neutral job. Now they are killing living things, but arguably they aren't bad people. They kill only what they need to, and they use everything that they've killed, all of their resources, to the best of their ability. And when he kills the fledglings later on in the story, he really is just doing his job. He's trying to eat or sell some feathers and flesh. And when you combine these two characters together, it's like there's this idea of you can't fault someone for a problem that occurs if you never took any steps to correct the problem yourself. All right, so now that I've talked, I've gotten, I've gotten into detail about the story. Let's go into some of the outside information that I found. Now, as usual, I couldn't find anything other than reprints of the text or PDF files of Popular Tales in the Norse. So today I decided to look on the Arne Thompson or the ATU index. And I found an Aesop's fable. 
that possibly goes hand in hand with this message. And it is called Jupiter and the Monkey. Being that it's a fable, it's short, so I'll just go ahead and read it right now. Jupiter issued a proclamation to all the beast and offered a prize to the one who, in his judgment, produced the most beautiful offspring. Among the rest came the monkey, carrying a baby monkey in her arms, a hairless, flat-nosed little fright. When they saw it, all the gods burst into a peal on peal of laughter. But the monkey hugged her little one to her and said, Jupiter may give the prize to whomever he likes, but I shall always think my baby is the most beautiful of them all. So this is another story that enforces this idea that the idea of beauty is very much an individual thing. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, literally in this case. All right, so those are my thoughts on the story. As always, if you have a comment, question, or concern, email me at Powered by Blue Fuel. Send me a message on Facebook and Instagram at Blue Belt Podcast, or simply leave a comment in the comment section on Podbean and SoundCloud. And also YouTube now. I started uploading full episodes to YouTube. The next move is Spotify. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I'll be back in two weeks with our... with our first ever biographical episode. In this next episode, in two weeks, I probably won't be telling a story, but I will be talking about the work of Peter Abjornsen and Jorgen Moe and how they contributed to folklore in general as well as Norwegian history. But anyway, that's all I have for today. See you next time.